Hello, everyone. Welcome to TechSoup Connect, Minnesota and Dakota's chapter, The Successes and Challenges of Small and All Volunteer Nonprofits. Please feel free to uh, put your name, pronouns, where you're based, and so forth in the chat so that you can share with your colleagues. And our hope for today is that you at least cover one of these, pick up a new tool, meet a new person that you can network with, partner with, and uh, share a resource or an idea or pick something up that you can use. Before we go any further, I wanted to show this map from more than 500 years ago about the peoples who uh, resided, lived here, and continue to live here. So this is our, our land acknowledgement. Um, we want to make sure that we recognize that our homes and community spaces, if you're in, joining us from Minnesota today, are the traditional homelands of our 11 tribal nations now and more than 165,000 indigenous people with whom we share this geography. One of our three uh, co-hosts has prepared several very informative slides about the tribes and native peoples in Minnesota. And there was one for North Dakota in there too. Here we go, North Dakota. So I encourage you when you get the slides later to spend some time exploring those links. And just a moment here to talk about our sponsor. There's a nonprofit called TechSoup and their mission is to connect nonprofits with donated and discounted products, both software and hard. If you are not already taking advantage of that, you might want to check that out. There are all sorts of brand name pieces of software, as well as things like Dell laptops and various kinds of hardware. Just as an example, they have provided us with this, what the discount can amount to. So the actual retail price of the cloud-based software subscriptions would be more than $2,600, but with 10 staff people, in other words, 10 licenses, you can get th this all for $201 a year instead. So that's quite a substantial savings and it gives you the enterprise software. I also, they have user tech forums, so you can inquire from your nonprofit colleagues around the world and uh, get ideas for anything you're encountering. So we are a chapter of many, and all of these presentations on here are free for you. So again, explore what you uh, can make, your, uh, make available to yourself from this. We also have our own events. So there are all of the different chapter events as well as ours. And our values are to welcome everyone that we're putting community first in those relationships. We invite your participation. So if you have something that you're passionate about, please be in touch. And just to commit to treat each other with kindness and respect. Here are the co-host contact names and contact information. We'll put this up again at the end. So uh, I'm Kathy Ehlers. Becky Schuler is our uh, Northern Minnesota connection. And Marianne Van Cura is also in the Twin Cities as I, I am. As well. Just to put something on your save the date calendar, the next one that we will do is on Thursday, April 7th, again, happening at noon. So the plan for today is to have our guest panelists introduction, introduce themselves, their organization, and one or two successes and challenges. And we are actually having some tech challenges of our own today. So we will see if we get everybody, but I, I think we may skip the breakout rooms depending and just go into some, some pre-planned discussion questions. And then, then we'll have just an open discussion time among the panelists. And we, if we have time, we'll take some additional Q&A from, from all of you uh, who are attending. Oh, and we do have time if you can stick around and things are going great with the discussion. We can stay as late as 1.15, but our official end time is 1 o'clock. So feel free to leave when you need to. And I think we will be starting today with Frost Simula, who self-refers to himself as a reluctant tech guy 
or the reluctant tech guy perhaps, with Heights Next, a community building organization that covers a uh, first wing suburb of Minneapolis called Columbia Heights. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frost Simula. Thanks, Kathy, for the introduction. Yes, uh, I'm with Heights Next in Columbia Heights. If you don't know where that's at, it's just north of Northeast Minneapolis. We call it Minneapolis's hat, if you will. <laughs> and we are a hyper-local nonprofit that's focused on, our tagline is a sustainable community. But what really happened when we first started getting together in 2015 is a grassroots movement. So we started asking, what do we want Columbia Heights to be? What does the next generation of Columbia Heights look like? What's next for Columbia Heights? And we threw out a bunch of different ideas into a lot of uh, word cloud sort of generation. And the ones that really kind of came to the front here are the, the darker ones. And we started thinking about what does it mean to be a sustainable community? And really all of these things come together and play into that. And that's what was the impetus for Heights Next. We ended up later on becoming more than a grassroots movement and becoming a 501c3. So what does Heights Next do? In a nutshell, we're all about community building. We're all about bringing people together to make the community stronger because that will make the community more resilient and more adaptable to change. And we also are all about not only getting neighbors together to just know each other, but to do work together and to do business together and to improve our economy and also to improve any idea, to improve ourselves, to improve our ways of thinking, and also in a sustainable fashion to improve our technology. So I'm going to pause on this slide for a bit to go over some of the things that you're looking at. Getting people together is probably one of the main things we do, and it's creating lots of events. Those events include everything from an annual beer tasting to we are a sponsor of a local plunge event, art in the park. We have just anything to bring people together. We have a dog day. We have gardening days. We have all kinds of different events and festivals that bring people together. One of our largest is our Pride Festival that was started uh, about three years ago. We also have a number of community service projects, not the least of which is our street cleanups, which are very popular. And we partner with other nonprofits and other volunteer groups to help staff all of our events and to bring them to life and to make them popular. Another one that we have that's very popular down in the center there is we have a pet bed workshop where lots of supplies are donated to make these basically fleece pillows or a pet bed for animals that are currently in shelters. And the entire community rallies around this. We get uh, thousands of these pet beds put together over the last few years and they are donated to a local animal shelter at the end of it. Everyone loves this. And then some of the things that we're just doing in the community is we're really trying to promote a, a greener lifestyle, greener technology. And we do have some programs that have really gained traction in Columbia Heights. I would like to think thank in, thanks in part to our, our group helping promote the ideas. And some of the initiatives that we're doing completely on our own, one that you can see in the lower left of that corner is we have started what's called a food forest, or it's like a community garden that anybody can just browse and uh, buy or pick up food from for free. And they can grow their own food for free, harvest it for free. And uh, this is something that we partner with the city on to help get started. We also have compost programs, fix-it clinics. Many of our city buildings now have solar panels. So we are making a difference. And I'm sorry, if, while I'm talking here, it sounds like someone else is typing and it's coming through on the audio if you want to mute. Sorry, it's Marianne. I'll do that. Sorry, thanks. Like Kathy introduced me, I am a reluctant tech guy. I worked in technology for about 18 years, designing and developing different types of web systems. And when it came to Heights Next, we needed some of those systems to serve us as well. And they were like, who can do this? Who can put these things together? And it started with just a website. How can we just get a website going? I think we had originally just started with a small group that was using Facebook, but not everybody uses Facebook and Facebook isn't a great place to uh, store documents, for example. So we needed something bigger and better. And I reluctantly said, I know how to set up these things if that's what you guys want. And so I said, sure, Frost, you're our guy. And that list of systems that we currently have just keeps growing and growing. And all of these things have become critical to what we do. Not only these these systems, but also the different things that it takes to operate all of those systems and the skills that are needed to do that. So not only am I doing all these things you see here, 
but also these as well. <laughs> because we are an all volunteer run nonprofit, we don't necessarily have um, all the people that are, and we can't, this is enough work to be broken down into an entire team of people if this were a, a for-profit company. But it, instead, it's just kind of me in my spare time doing whatever I can among my many other volunteer activities. <laughs> That's really all I had to talk about today was just this huge amount of, of tools and operations that we have to do that it takes to run a nonprofit. And I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these things. Great. Thank you so much, Ross. That was a wonderful introduction. Let, let's, let's just leave that slide up for right now. No, the one with your okay. contact info. I think that's good. So one of the, it sounds like there are many community partners that are involved with Heights Next. And I don't know if you would want to speak about how things were at the very beginning. What was the, what were some of the first actions that were taken to get Heights Next started? So from a nonprofit standpoint, are we looking at this from a tech standpoint? Non, the nonprofit standpoint, because yeah, although many attendees, many people viewing this will be from the tech, sort of accidental techie stamp a general interest in nonprofit development and going from that startup phase. What sorts of things were the first community generating events? So the first ideas that we had were just to bring the community together. And that started by reaching out to other organizations that were already volunteer groups. There, there are plenty of volunteer groups in town already. But some of them had different histories and they had different um, initiatives and they had different focus. And we wanted to be specifically focused on things like resilience and sustainability. And a big part of that, especially in Columbia Heights, is we're a very diverse community. Bringing people together can be a challenge, not only just in interests, but also across cultures, across languages. We were trying to come up with things that could be of interest to just about anybody. And the way we ended up becoming a nonprofit after running several different events, for example, like a very popular event of ours is like this, uh, a dog day afternoon where we just thought, Hey, everybody likes dogs, bring their dogs in. And that's actually true for only some people don't like dogs, especially like the Muslim community. They don't like dogs touching them. They don't like being around dogs in that regard. It's not part of their faith. So that was exclusionary. And we, we started learning that, okay, we need to have more, more diverse events to bring people together. Again, like we, this uh, Cheers for Beers uh, beer tasting fundraiser every year, which is uh, very successful, but not everybody drinks either. So we've, we've expanded to a lot of different areas. And one that really seemed to hit home at one point was a farmer's market. Everybody liked the idea of this farmer's market and getting a group together to just start and run a farmer's market is no small feat. It's a lot of work. And there was actually a separate group that was already trying to do this. And they thought, what if we partnered with Heights Next, who is already trying to do something sustainable? And we bring in this idea of a farmer's market, which is a sustainable practice. What if we all became one single thing? And, uh, and that's where we decided to actually end up becoming um, a 501c3. As it turns out, the farmer's market lost traction <laughs> because it needed somebody to really spearhead it and to take control of it and almost run it as a full-time operation. And uh, we just couldn't find the volunteers to do that. So it's still something that's very much an interest to us. There is a local church that runs their own small farmer's market, which is going well, but uh, Heights Next itself is not a farmer's market. But that was the impetus of how we got going. With regard to successes and challenges, what do you think would be of interest to, if you were going to communicate with a lot of other similarly placed organizations? What advice might you have or what would be, you be seeking in terms of finding out what they do? I, I think a lot of communities, some communities have something like Heights Next, but maybe some don't and would be looking to start something like that. So I just thought anything else you could share about recruiting for the board or fundraising, something like that. Yeah. So we quickly learned, and if you're in part of any sort of volunteer organization, you're going to learn that if you explore other volunteer organizations in the area, it's all the same people. 
right? It's pretty much the same core group of folks who are volunteering in all these different groups. And when that happens, if those people are asked to do too much, they burn out. What we have found is that when you are trying to expand or you're trying to grow your outreach in a certain area, pick a topic that's really hitting home with people and certain folks will just step up and ask how they can help and then keep those folks just in that area. For example, for us, we wanted to start a, we heard a lot of feedback that it'd be great if Columbia Heights had a pride celebration, anything that is more, more like a festival or a carnival type atmosphere. And we said, great, that sounds good. Who do we know that's in, in the pride community that would be willing to help run this? And at first people were very reluctant to like, well, I don't know, how's this going to look? A bunch of non-LGBT people trying to put on a, an LGBT event. And we got lots of buy-in for people who were interested and were, help, were interested in helping out. And after that first year, after they saw the kind of caliber of events that we host and we put on, several of those people decided to step up and take charge and to start spearheading and said, yes, I love this. I love this organization. I love the event that we had. I want to help you in charge of it next year, which is great because that takes the, the pressure off of us, that core group that's those main volunteers that are always around. And that's been happening with all of our events, with even our street cleanups, which is one of our original ideas of getting people together. We have volunteers stepping up to help run that now as well. Art in the Park that debuted last year, there are several people who are just art fanatics, and that's the only thing they want to do with Heights Next is help run the Art in the Park event. And that's just fine. So we found that's actually pretty sustainable is when you get volunteers to just focus on one thing. Super. Um, Great frost. Yeah. Um, I, I understand that Victoria is with us. You'll stop sharing your slides. I will get back. Hello, Victoria. I'm sorry for our technical issues here. And I'm so glad that you're here. Let me, should we show those slides from yours that I've got? Or did you have something sure. you want to share? Okay. okay. Nope. All right. Let me see if I can get back to my screen here. My computer's running a little bit slow today. So Kathy, while you're digging up the slides, maybe we could just ask Victoria to introduce herself and yes, that would start be telling us a little bit about Legacy Family Center. That would be great. Thanks for that, Becky. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Victoria. We're so glad you could join today. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to share about myself and about, about Legacy Family Center. So my name is Victoria Capet. I am originally from Liberia, West Africa. I came to this cold tundra, um, not on my own free will, but my parents to go to boarding school. That's how I found myself in Minnesota. And I've been in Minnesota all throughout my whole life. And this is my home. I don't know anywhere else, never lived outside of this state. So I enjoy being here in Minnesota. So legacy, I'm a social worker by background. I went to St. Kate's and got my BSW and then St. Thomas and got my MA in higher education. And then last year, as though I didn't have anything else to do, I decided to go back and get my certificate in Montessori to be a primary school teacher. So education is for me, the thing that, that fuels me both passionately and something that I do for fun. I just think that education is something that Everybody, not everybody, but people should be wedded to at all times, but specifically early literacy. I feel like early literacy is something that every child should have, should have access to. And so that's where I have focused my attention over these last two and a half years after working as a mental health social worker for a long. So we started Legacy Family Center. The four mothers decided to start Legacy Family Center because we noticed that there were gaps in education and social services with families that I was working with during my time with child protection and their family services. So that's the reason why we decided to start Legacy Family Center. We've done a lot of things in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center over these last decade. I mean, for a whole decade now, that's what we've been doing. We do coat, winter coat drive, we do food, we do early literacy, and then we work with different organizations as well to do equity policy. So over 
the last two years, we've been working with the Osseo School District in Brooklyn Park to pass the equity policy. And that's something that I'm very proud of because I feel like in order for everybody to thrive, we need to all be on the same page and moving forward as one organism to be able to make Minnesota the state that we want to all live in. Right now, we are doing our youth programming. And the idea behind that, there are a lot of youth who have to constantly look for jobs here and find jobs there. And they don't have any, they don't have any kind of skills to go and find their first job. So we decided that asset can be harnessed in the way that makes early literacy possible for their siblings and also build their self-esteem and give them a reason for them to be in school and listen to the teachers and do their work. So the concept behind that is that we pay youth in the family. So if you're a family who have different age groups and you have a youth from 13 to 17, we'll pay that youth to read to a younger sibling who is from birth to 12 so that we keep that in the family, make sure that we're strengthening the family and then bring that um, early literacy into the family. So that's what we're doing right now. Every month we pay a youth $80. Well, then I met Becky and she's, why are you not paying them $100 so that they can be able to get their phone and be able to pay for the phone? So now we're paying them $100 every month to make sure that the kids get a little bit of money for them to also pay for their phone because the videos are taking a lot of time, a lot of space on their phone. So if you're youth from 13 to 17, we'll pay you um, $100. And after you've read 12 books and you upload those videos, that's how we keep you accountable. So that's who I am. That's wonderful. I hope I have my mic on. Can you hear me? Okay. And I just wanted to interject here. The Brooklyn Center has about 31,000 population, Brooklyn Park about 80 thousand so it's more than more than a hundred thousand people in the coverage area that you're currently working within and that's about the Brooklyn Park Wikipedia knows so much is the sixth largest city in the state of Minnesota so we're talking about an amazing service here for these communities and and those two communities together cover 35 square miles and back to previously, we had Columbia Heights is about 20,000 population and covers, we're, we're small but mighty, we cover three and a half square miles and have a population of about 9,000, just to give some, I'm sorry, uh, 19,000 and the three and a half square miles. Back to, to Legacy Family Center, let me just put one more thing here. In terms of the partnerships and the press coverage and things, I'm curious what some of your uh, successes and challenges have been given the fact that you're currently all volunteer, which is the same with all in you know, all of the people we invited to speak today. Just curious about that. So we have been really successful with having volunteers come on. Once we present to organizations, we have not had any kind of problem recruiting volunteers. And because we're all volunteer run organization that also makes it difficult for us to then have people who are consistent in doing like the different, the different projects that we have. Because people have other things that are going on in their lives. So we can't say, oh, you take this project and you do it for maybe six months to a year. So inconsistency is a big, is a big challenge for us to be able to grow and move the organization from an all volunteer organization to maybe a third of volunteers, a third of paid staff, and just to make sure that we build our capacity and infrastructure so that we can meet the needs in the community. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment here. And to open things up to people who have, why don't you go ahead and unmute Frost and Victoria, and let's start our, our dialogue time now, anybody? Uh, uh, Kathy, maybe I could step in and volunteer to say something about the heart of a border collie rescue until we did, I uh, thank you Frost for letting me know I was typing 
in public. <laughs> I was trying to get a, a message out to everybody on the attendee list so they had a login and um, I, I appreciate the, the heads up. And um, here is a link for Vicki's organization. I work with as a treasurer for a group called Heart of a Border Collie Rescue. And, and I can say that this group is very proud of being a having a working board and no staff. But I can also tell you that two of the people work full time. One is a retired physics teacher and one has a landscape business with her husband. And she is one of the reasons, they are one of the reasons that the group has made over $100,000 in the last couple of years and helped many border collie type animals in Minnesota and the Dakotas find homes. So I can tell you why I volunteered with them. A few years back, I had a, a border collie named Kate and she passed away. And it seemed every time I ran across uh, a rescue, someone from this particular rescue group in a dog event, I felt calmer. And when in November of one year, I began to feel like my, the dog who had passed away was very present to me. And so in the, because of the spirit of my dog, Kate, I decided to volunteer with this group. And eventually I fostered nine dogs and became the treasurer. What's interesting is paid staff are wonderful. And I always advocate for structuring nonprofits so that the people can be paid. But in the case of a lot of our Minnesota small nonprofits, they start out with a heart of gold and they do what they can with, with the resources they have. So the story of this group is that they've made a conscious decision to, to be a volunteer. And many of the board members come from what I call some of the zip codes with healthier incomes. And they have friends who have healthier incomes. So one of the things that's been strategic is in being successful is that the two people who have the most contact with donors and with potential fosters and potential adopters, the people with the most direct contact are deliberately kind and affirming and well-informed. They are virtuous in how they approach other people and how they approach the animals. Second, one of the board members has adopted the Give MN event in the fall. That person might not do very much the rest of the year except provide some advice as a member of the medical community, but that person adopts that fall Give MN event. They make sure it happens and they get other people to volunteer to help them promote that event. So those are things that can be done by anybody, any group, regardless of income demographic or regardless of, of my brain went on hiatus there for a minute, but I'll also add that when people volunteer, the, the next thing to do is to take them seriously. We had a retired person who volunteered to do something, anything. And for a year, she hung out there. And one day I took something to her house and I said, boy, the one thing I really need is a bookkeeper. I cannot keep up with all the transactions of this, of this group. And I was willing to be treasurer, but there were hundreds of transactions sometimes in a month. So she said, I can do that. And I dropped my jaw and I said, really? And for a year, she's been giving us about 20 hours a week of volunteer time for bookkeeping and other things. Where did that come from? It came out of the heavens. So take people seriously, follow up and ask. And the other thing is she lived, her partner is the top nonprofit accountant in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> and her a partner volunteered to be our accountant. So I call that a, a accident, a happy accident. But I just will reinforce that talk to people, say what you need, and it still takes work. But those are some of the things that have worked for this particular group, make friends. We only leverage Facebook and a little bit of Instagram right now. And we got a separate volunteer to do those things. 
So those are some of the things about heart of a border collie. Thank you, Marianne. That's very, very informative. And that's, does that cover the whole country or? So we have a net, we, I say, but uh, we have a network around the country. Uh, I would say that mostly the, most of the animal and the fosters are in Minnesota and the Dakotas with some in Wisconsin, but like a lot of nonprofits, they've leveraged their efforts by networking with groups doing related work. We take groups from Texas that would be killed in kill shelters through our partner Passport for Paws. We use, we work with Legacy Rescue and a group that does light shine that does rescues off of reservations in the Dakotas. So building your network and your people skills of being positive and kind with the people in your partner network goes a long way toward strengthening the volunteer efforts. Thanks for sharing all of that, Marianne. It's, it's really interesting to hear all the different organizations. And one of the things I think, and, and I just say this as a, I say this, I shouldn't minimize it, say this as a, 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 a white person, is that there is a lot of privilege associated with with white people in our society. And I, I just like to acknowledge that because I think it leads to additional options. So I guess in terms of partnering with various organizations, just re recognizing that there are, you know, differences in access, differences in time availability and resources. And it's interesting to hear, like we've got this whole nationwide scope then of the partnership and it, I think Legacy Family Center has I had the, the joy of having a conversation with Victoria before we, we got on here today a while back. And there are dreams of bigger things. I'll just not share any more than that because it's not ready for prime time, but yeah. So there are, and, and every organization I think has some kind of a dream as to what they might become. And perhaps having a, a paid staff person would be uh, a, a way for some organizations to really move to that next level. With regard to, I was just, I guess also the observation that I had was that the multi-generational aspects of all of these three organizations and how to foster that kind of conversation because it's not something that seems to just naturally occur. But if it's specific, people are specifically brought together, oftentimes there's a lot of joy and understanding that's fostered. And also between different subgroups, cultural groups, and so forth in, within a community. So I, I, one thing I was curious about is if any of these three groups have ever thought about having, for example, an AmeriCorps volunteer, which does require some financial input by the organization, but also there's some governmental support for that as well. And if not, that's fine, but I just, has that ever come up? And if so, what were your conversations about? So this is Victoria. I think that's something that we've been thinking about that we might do, but like you said, there's a funding issue that the organization has to um, participate in and we don't have that kind of funding right now, but hopefully as we build our capacity and and continue to leverage the volunteers that we have and their capacity, then that's something that we can think about, but not right now. Yeah, Heights Next has not looked into that. Actually, we don't, I didn't know about that until you had brought it up, Kathy. Um, didn't know about AmeriCorps, but also we are very hyper-local. Want somebody who's invested in the community as well and not just willing to do some grunt work, but that's what I do behind the scenes is grunt work on top of the actual volunteering for our events. There might be a college student, somebody who grew up in Columbia Heights, who would like to return to the community and, and do some work. Could Welcome, be. Teresa. Thank you. Would you like to say hi and where your perspective, where you're calling in from today? Sure. My name is Teresa Menting. I'm the executive director for Gable Family Foundation and Women's Empowerment Series. We're in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and serve women and children in not only our community, but surrounding communities as well. Thank you for having me today. We have not used AmeriCorps for volunteers. I don't know if you can maybe share a little bit more information about that. 
I've pretty much shared what I know. I have never had specific experience myself, but I've been in organizations that have talked about it tangentially and never really got to the point of, of implementing that. It's similar to the, the Peace Corps, only it happens domestically. So there's a, there's a, a living allowance, um, sort of a stipend type salary. It's fairly low. So probably if it's a younger person who's doing this, they might be having their living situation might be with roommates to be able to afford to participate. And then at the end, there is a stipend given to the student for tuition or to pay back student loans. So it's once they've completed the year or two of service, then they get a chunk of money that can be specifically applied to that. So it, it can help a student afford an education. So I just wanted to weigh in and share that a number of years ago, when I was the executive director of a rural nonprofit, I tried to recruit an AmeriCorps volunteer. And I just wanted to say, I think AmeriCorps is a great program and a great concept. And I love the fact that students get an educational stipend of roughly $5,000 or something in that neighborhood to use for school. And I don't think it's the greatest option for all volunteer nonprofits necessarily, unless you're in the fortunate position where Marianne is and you have some people who are willing to do some full-time volunteer work. Because I'll just say, I drove to Little Falls from Bemidji for a training, which took quite a long time between travel and participation. I filled out the whole application because you have to do the paperwork on the front end. I did a lot of work trying to recruit people and basically the living stipend was so minimal that I couldn't get a student who was willing to work for that because they also needed housing and that combination just didn't work for students. And I was in Bemidji at the time, which is not a really little town, but still it was hard for me to find somebody who was in a position where they could accept. I do think it can work well for larger organizations and our local Habitat chapter, Habitat for Humanity has, they have a very small paid staff pattern, but they've made it work. But in general, I don't know that I think it's a great option for really tiny organizations or all volunteer organizations. It's a cost benefit analysis of it really takes time. It's a concept that I talk about when I teach grant writing. There's no free lunch. <laughs> So AmeriCorps volunteers are not exactly free. Not only is there a little bit of a cost share, but it's also your time involved in the orientation and hiring and ongoing supervision process because you have to be available to support that AmeriCorps student on an ongoing basis so they can, can be successful in that role. So I'm sorry, I don't mean to... Well, that was come down hard on it. I just think you need some capacity for it. Points to a future topic that we might have organizations that are very small and have successfully had an AmeriCorps and what it takes. Mm -hmm. We could have put that on the docket for us sometime in the future. Uh, Isn't Teresa, that a great reframing, Kathy? Thank you. I was just going to say, I do think university interns are a great resource for small and all volunteer nonprofits. So Teresa, did you oh, have this comment? Yeah, I was just wondering, so these are college students through AmeriCorps? Oftentimes college mm -hmm. students are recent grads. Yeah. Okay. But I don't think it's limited to that. If someone's between careers or changing careers, I think sometimes they take it. And there are elder AmeriCorps, I forget what they call those, but like people who read, for example, in Victoria's organizations, uh, there, there are programs like that. So maybe it's worth another whole program to, to explore that in more detail. And before we get off of here, Teresa, I want to make sure that we get your contact info. So if you would like to um, be contacted by anyone after the fact, that we can make that available. If you want to put it in the chat, that would be one way to accomplish it. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour, which is when we officially said we would wrap things up. We are available to stay if there might be a few more things to talk about. It seems like we, we really didn't. So let, let's just have a show of hands. Who would like to stay until 1.15, potentially? I can. I, I, I can. Another I can. meeting I have to get to. Oh. Okay. 
Yeah. All right, we will then wrap up here. Uh, I just wanted to again thank. Could we do one thing real quick? Very quickly, we've got two minutes. And I was going to. Bob be asked for ways. Bob asked for ways to promote his organization to people in Greater Minnesota. I just thought if we could just sure. popcorn it. If anybody in the room has a few thoughts here and there about things that work. Okay, I don't think most people heard what he did. Do you? Do you want to speak about that? Becky put the link to his organization in the chat. And oh, okay. So he is operating a diaper bank for Minnesota, babies' diapers. And it's, he said he would like to connect with groups in greater Minnesota who might be interested to participate and uh, to contact him if they are. And maybe we just better make sure we whoever is comes on a little later, they don't necessarily see all the prior things in the chat. So if you want to put his contact information, we'll also put it in the after the email that goes out afterwards and post it to the site. So that's great. I will share our contact info again, if I can get there. I may have to advance through a couple of slides. Victoria, have you done any work with Bob's group, the Diaper Bank of Minnesota? Because I'm sure there are some families you're serving who could perhaps benefit from that. I just wondered. You've made so many good connections. Actually, when I worked with child protection and my families, I have families that I didn't even know that that he was the one running that, but I've referred clients to, <laughs> to that program many a times Excellent. before which is interesting to see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. because you have I, a list of different programming. So that's one of the services that I refer clients to. Mm -hmm. I noticed that all of the organizations on today seem to have really fabulous websites. And I'm impressed by that. Having experience as a small business owner, the pain and suffering of what it takes to launch a decent website. So I thought that was interesting. The Diaper Bank has a beautiful website. Legacy Family has a beautiful website. I'm sorry, Heights Next. I wanted to call it Columbia Next and I knew that was wrong. <laughs> has a beautiful website. And I think Heart of a Border Collie has a website. Is that right, Marianne? Or are you- I put the link in the chat right. and um, we have a Facebook presence also. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. And in, in, the, in the slides, there, there is information about another organization. They exist. Clearwater County Humane Society has a Facebook page, a very active Facebook page with themselves and their partners. And they do not have a website yet, but the Facebook page seems extremely well used and is serving them well. I think it's time here. I want to say thank you again to Frost Asimila, Victoria Carpe, and Marianne Van Cura, and Teresa Menting for being here today and to thank you to Becky Schuler, who is our hostess with the mostest. She is providing a lot of uh, leadership as well as Marianne. We are the four, the, the three hosts of this chapter and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for attending our program today. Bye now. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.